Hello and welcome back to an episode of Generation Benjamin. My name is American Ben, and why can't sci-fi and fantasy imagine alternatives to capitalism or feudalism is the question that author Kyle Galindez asks in an article he wrote for Salon.com. Well, today I'd like to take a look at his various arguments and see if I can break them down and respond to them in a helpful way. It's an interesting, albeit somewhat short-sighted question, and even more so if made broader, extrapolated to the form, is there a singular fundamental structure that bonds all human works? Would it be so bold to aver that the Bible has inspired all works of fiction? Perhaps not. Though perhaps the story in the Bible itself is derived from the most early forms of storytelling. The implication here, when narrowed down to Galindez's initial question is, are the basic similarities we see in societies throughout fiction but reflections of human nature and evolution? Well, I suppose we don't need to venture that deep for today's video. Let's look more closely at Galindez's specific plaints. He writes, While fantasy and science fiction authors are great at imagining new forms of magic and technology, authors aren't so good at imagining different political systems. Indeed, for the most part, they fall back on the same old political or economic systems. For fantasy, we have our usual monarchies and empires, kings and queens, nobles and commoners. For sci-fi, the future is often bleak, dominated by hyper-capitalist corporate galactic warfare or techno-bureaucratic empires clinging to power on their newly annexed planets. A classic critique of fiction is this, that stories, as creative as they may be, are all founded upon the same basic societal structures and contain the same basic institutions. That said, Galindez has cast a very wide net here. I'm not sure the societies and systems he describes as pervading all of fiction are as limited as his thesis suggests. But perhaps we need some definitions here before we can go on, to help us identify if Galindez is speaking the truth to any degree. According to Oxford Languages, capitalism is an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. Oxford Languages then defines feudalism as the dominant social system in medieval Europe in which the nobility held lands from the crown in exchange for military service and vassals were in turn tenants of the nobles while the peasants were obliged to live on the lord's land and give him homage, labor, and a share of the produce, notionally in exchange for military protection. Now, most often people contrast capitalism with socialism because feudalism is an antiquated system and I'm not really sure why Galindez neglects to mention the former as if there's no socialist principle seen in science fiction. The societies in The Expanse, for instance, show plenty of signs of being mostly socialist in nature. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. I'll first concede my thesis. I think Galindez's mistake is a definitional one. The reason all systems, both in fiction and not, can be assigned to the capitalist, feudalist, socialist, techno-bureaucratic, or whatever moniker is because, well, no society, fictional or otherwise, is perfectly consistent with its stated economic or political philosophy. Could we not provide examples that prove America to be both capitalistic and socialistic? Ask someone this, at what exact point does a given society become capitalist or socialist? Plenty of people can give you an exact definition of either type of society, but no one can point to the precise moment at which a society becomes one or the other outside of a ruling body simply ordaining such to be the case. The economic terms Galindez refers to are really broad. They encompass many subsystems and thus are hard to escape when delineating the philosophy of any given society. The truth is, when someone calls a society capitalistic or feudalistic or socialistic, they're not referring to an idealist notion of any of these systems, but rather a practical one that's based on extent. As in, if a country's market is privatized enough, we deem the country a capitalist state. And if its market is controlled tightly by the government, we instead say the country is a decidedly socialist state. None of the aforementioned economic and political systems are entirely mutually exclusive in application, and that is why Galindez's argument is largely fallacious. Galindez himself comes up with examples that ostensibly subvert his own point. He writes, Certainly there are key works in science fiction that push us to consider non-capitalist futures. Ursula K. Le Guin's 1974 book The Dispossessed, an ambiguous utopia, is exemplary in this regard. In the book, we travel alongside our hero and physicist Shevik, who hails from a planet governed by anarcho-syndicalist principles. 
political and economic equality, working class self-management, equality between genders, and a voluntarist orientation towards social life. Although his is a planet of relative material poverty, we nonetheless see how these principles inform his own worldview, including his disdain for inequality in all its guises. Now, if we were to perform a scientific study on every fictional civilization, small and large, using the population of all societies across every sci-fi and fantasy franchise, I imagine we'd come up with a lot more examples of non-traditional economic and political systems than Galindez mentions here. Actually, I imagine in the comment section of this video, y'all are going to have some great examples of philosophically novel fictional societies. Warhammer 40k, for instance, has a very unique power dynamic because of its federalist system, which on a federal level is in some ways feudal and in others libertarian. And on a planetary level features all sorts of different modes of rule and economics, and that's just within the human empire. I mean, what would the warp and all of Immaterium be considered? Well, I guess feudalist soul reaping or something like that. By the way, anarcho-syndicalism, the economic system Galindez celebrates as being front and center in the dispossessed, is not exactly a fine example of breaking the capitalist-feudalist binary. Syndicalism is a worker-focused philosophy defined by Oxford as a movement for transferring the ownership and control of the means of production and distribution to workers' unions. In other words, syndicalism imagines a society in which workers have seized control of the economy and government. Anarcho-syndicalism, then, is a method for workers in capitalist society to extend their reach beyond the economy to broader society and thus bring about a pseudo-anarchistic system of rule under the governance of all workers. This movement itself hasn't really played out in reality or prevailed in any society, and its basic tenets are not entirely extricable from socialism. It's thus hard to foresee how a new type of political system like this would play out in application when all it's been so far is, as stated, a movement within capitalist societies. Perhaps then, when writers form their versions of the future by some logically imagined sequence of events, they always arrive at a version of society that doesn't veer too much from the reality of today, aside from crucial advancements in technology. What if, just as sometimes capitalism in effect is corporatism and socialism in effect is authoritarianism, anarcho-syndicalism is in effect either capitalism or authoritarianism? Authors can't assume that the ideal state proposed by any philosophy will be realized. Perhaps one of Orwell's three totalitarian superstates in 1984 was originally conceived to be anarcho-syndicalist until nefarious actors saw a vulnerable population of committed egalitarians who could be seized upon, and thus these malevolent actors usurped power where no one should have risen above another and turned the state authoritarian. The reason we get the societies we do is that human nature and physical nature overall breeds them. Sci-fi writers are thus doing right by their works by deriving their societies from the societies of today, albeit sometimes advanced, sometimes regressed, and almost always changed in various ways. Galindez rightly highlights The Expanse as another sci-fi series characterized by civilizations that can't quite be confined to the typical political and economic systems we see in the modern world, but then he falters when he steps into Star Wars territory. He writes, More recently, the popular sci-fi novel series turned Amazon show The Expanse pushes the politics of sci-fi in critical directions. In the not-so-distant future, the solar system is divided into three opposed camps, Earth, Mars, and the Belters. The Belters are those who are confined to mining asteroids in the asteroid belt for precious resources that support the populations of Earth and Mars. While the Belters in recent seasons pursue their own freedom through extraordinarily violent means aimed at destroying countless civilian lives on Earth, their inclusion in the story nevertheless points towards the willingness in science fiction to explicitly represent the working classes. It's an interesting contrast to, say, Star Wars, where the question of what is produced by whom and how it is distributed is not discussed at all. Okay. Tell me you know nothing about Star Wars lore without telling me you know nothing about Star Wars lore, Mr. Galindez. I enjoyed Galindez's article, but I suspect his experience of Star Wars doesn't extend beyond the first three films. Star Wars lore is rife with working class representation. But even so, I'm sort of confused. Is Galindez upset with the lack of non-capitalist societies in sci-fi or the lack of representation of what he calls the working classes? If the latter, I'm not sure what he's talking about. Almost all of sci-fi portrays rebellions by the common man against fascist or tyrannical movements of some sort. If the former, well, 
I don't think it'd be impossible to identify elements of all major economic and political systems in The Expanse and any other sci-fi series Galinda deems as containing rare political imagination. The truth is, we don't really know enough about how each economy works in The Expanse, but Earth's definitely seems to have evolved into a socialist state in which the government exerts heavy control of the land and supplies people with basic income. Mars's system is hard to pin down aside from calling it a dictatorship under the guise of parliamentary republicanism. Could it be de facto feudal in some ways? Maybe. It's a corrupt state that probably allots rewards to citizens and trade for favors. And it could also be considered communistic in original conception, if not an application, given the government's total power over the planet's territory and population living on it. The Belt, on the other hand, we could call a socialist state, given the complete submission of its people to the state's employ, the state's control over the means of production, and the fact that while the former two clauses are true, it appears that Belters can possess property, especially when they first discover it. Galindez's article culminates in the revelation that he intends to use his own sci-fi story to break the capitalist feudalist mold. He writes, Given that so much of our popular fantasy and science fiction stories, but certainly not all, I can't read everything, rarely seem to introduce new political or economic systems, I wanted in my own story to showcase a different sort of arrangement. The story's hero, a young woman named Uiza Serizar, is indeed drawn to the possibility of such a world. Captured when she was young after her city is attacked by gun-wielding overseas invaders from a place called Hafrir, she was forced into a life of servitude before being thrown indefinitely into prison. But there, she reads a forbidden book she managed to smuggle in, one that calls into question the divine authority of monarchs and the power of the nobility, claiming the commoners ought to instead collectively manage society's productive tools in their own interests. At the same time, she's heard rumors of a mysterious new collectivity calling themselves ungoverned, deep in the swamps outside the ruins of her old city. Trapped in prison, Oiza can thus only ponder if the ungoverned are real, if they practice the teachings of the book she loves, and if she might one day break free to find them. Listen, I want to commend Galindez for trying to be creative in devising the society in his book, which I hope turns out to be a terrific read. I'll even include a link to purchase it in the description below. However, nothing he says here implies that his society will take on a novel form. It sounds like a socialist society, or perhaps an anarcho-syndicalist society that will descend into socialism and then authoritarianism, as socialist societies often do. See, this is where sci-fi and fantasy writers run into problems when trying to broach new territory in terms of societal invention. They can imagine whatever crazy form of society they want, but if they then play out its development intelligently, taking into account human nature, they'll probably end up with some sort of hyper-capitalist or socialist society. If the ungoverned in Galindez's book are indeed real, then he'll have to offer a convincing explanation as to how they prevented a dictator from rising at some point in the course of their civilization's rise. Now, my point here isn't to prove to you that any given fictional society operates under a certain political system. If I wanted to do that, I would have been way more patient in explaining my examples, and I would have done more research prior to making this video. My point is more this. The problem Galindez highlights isn't due to the unimaginativeness of sci-fi and fantasy authors. It's due to the broad scope of the terms used to describe the most common economic and political systems, and the laws of human nature and physics that necessitate their existence. Capitalism and socialism are able to refer in different ways to almost every society on Earth. The terms speak to the most basic ways that humans construct their societies, rather than to their strict definitions. And thus, it's unlikely that we'll ever see a society with no elements of either. One term connotes socialization, and the other term connotes privatization. As the Wachowskis would say, the binary is a false choice. The terms socialist and capitalist are kind of bad at describing societies because each society probably needs its own unique term to describe its specific political and economic system. This all said, I can't help but suspect that what Galindez really wants is to see more plainly thriving, ideologically pure anti-capitalist societies in fiction. Making that a reality, however, might take some poor philosophizing and a rejection of history's lessons on the part of authors, and I'm not sure that's such a desirable end. Galindez may want a more absolute version of anti-capitalist society to be common in fiction, but what history's greatest sci-fi and fantasy authors have given us are living, breathing societies that aren't strictly defined by a single ideology, whether capitalism, feudalism, socialism, or whatever else. In any case, eh, give Galindez's book a chance. I've linked it in the description down below. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a big thumbs up. 
Remember to comment down below. I'm excited to hear all your thoughts on this video and subscribe to this channel. And don't forget to hit that damn notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben and I'll catch you next time. Generation Benjamin, peace.